Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Um, I have the distinct honor, two honors, really. Firstly, to remind us that this is a serious occasion. It's for us to recall the contribution of John Snyder, and this lectureship is in his name. John made numerous contributions to the Department of Gastroenterology, and he will be remembered eternally. Um, but I sh I'm sure he would agree with me when I say that amongst the most impressive things he managed to accomplish was to establish, with the help of Blair Raber over here, the celiac program. I think that Vanessa said it beautifully last night. John would be extremely proud to know that his protege or his protégés uh, have put together a program that has now achieved national significance. Uh, we can proudly say that we are executing his vision. He wrote it up in best practices for the celiac management uh, for practitioners in pediatrics. We practice it in a multidisciplinary clinic now where every single child that comes through there not only gets the benefit of a medical evaluation, which also involves our neurology team, has a psychiatric, if it's not a psychiatric, a psychological evaluation, gets a full press education. And uh, I am really proud to say that in recent times, we've had parents write back to us in a post-clinic survey saying, this is positively the best medical experience I've ever had. And, uh, you know, John started this. I think he would look down and say, man, this is terrific. But that's just a piece of it. Vanessa has just finished her fourth book on how to cook for a gluten-free diet. She has... <laughs> She has arranged for all schools throughout the United States to have a set of rules or guidelines for the management of a gluten-free environment in those schools so that parents will have a rational response with the uh, team in that school in the way that children with allergies enjoy. Beyond that, we have a research program, which I think we can all be very proud of, we are going to resolve how celiac disease causes neurological problems. John actually wrote the IRB that got an interest in headaches, and that blossomed into a gift which has allowed us to incorpor into our, incorporate into our team the whole neurology process. These are major accomplishments, and uh, I feel very fortunate that I can be part of it, and I know he would be very proud of us for it. The second honor I have is to introduce Jocelyn to you. Jocelyn is part of the up and coming wave that includes Vanessa, you know, these energy mavens who have no end of energy and have made an enormous difference with celiac disease. Um, I could go through and we'll try to go through some of her achievements. Uh, she is part of the faculty at that place up north, Harvard. I, I think you might have heard of it. And, uh, you know, they still first, we're first, we're getting there, we're going to work at it. And, uh, but she is chair of the Celia program there and has accomplished awards. I'm not going to go through them all, but 13, I think, awards every over a, I don't know how many year period. As one ended, she got another, 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 and another. Up until this time, she is now chair of the Celia committee for the North American Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology and Nutrition. She has a vision which will take much of the education stuff that Vanessa has prepared and others have prepared and spread that throughout our society and probably internationally. Um, I had written out all the details of her accomplishments, but I don't want to take from her time. And I want you to come up here and give us that great talk. Thank you, Jocelyn. Thank you very much, Dr. Krisner, for the kind introduction. I have to say that it's an honor to be here to talk today. And 
I was not fortunate enough to have the opportunity to work with Dr. Schneider, but I do have the benefit of the view from his shoulders and being able to work with the wonderful folks in the program that he helped build and create. And I have to say that we envy you down here down south, um, and we often look to what you guys are doing to try and help us be better. Um, so we will be number one together is the goal. Um, I, I know we started a little bit late, but um, something that Dr. Christie did not mention is that I also work in the Arctic. And so I wanted to have a few slides for people who are stragglers, which is usually me. Um, first of all, the disclosures, we're starting to get some drugs and celiac disease, so research studies, nothing related to what I'm talking to today. So you can probably tell by my accent, I'm from Canada. And so uh, Manitoba is the red province in the middle, that's where I did my residency, Boston, Red Sox. Um, the polar bear is where I practice pediatrics, and the Ogopogo Lake Monster is where I grew up, which is actually relevant to this talk today because it makes me wonder about, you know, just exactly what is the digestive system and what are we doing? So this is pictures from where I grew up. The upper left corner is the wine shop. That's the only real job I ever had was wine tasting and wine tours. Um, below is the actual view from the winery where we, from the, um, from outside where we do the tours. And then this is the food that we ate, because it's British California, out west, um, getting warmer all the time. This is uh, ranked Inlet, which is above the Arctic Circle. It's a primarily Inlet community. And as you can see, there's a big difference between winter and summer, but it's beautiful all the time. And this is some of the vegetation in summer. It's very small, um, because nothing really can grow. There's not enough time. Um, and housing is a little bit different too. On the top is a more traditional style housing, um, but it would be sort of semi-permanent because um, boots would migrate, but they would come back to the right here. And then this is below sort of more modern plywood-based summer cabins. And I don't actually have some in the summer because pretty much everybody in the community is out on the land, so they can't come to summer because they're just not there. Um, and the Honda is the main form of transportation. This is the winter housing. This is an actual igloo. Um, which is much taller than me. I could not jump up and reach the roof. Um, and it was definitely warm, but it was a low minus 60 with wind chill that particular day. So I'm not sure it was actually above freezing inside, but it was definitely warm. Um, and this is some of the food that my patients eat, uh, patients eat. And so this is the country food, which is a traditional diet, which includes things such as blue the whale and caribou. So not the foods that we're used to eating and not the foods that usually show up on this food guide, but we do have a difference in guidance in Canada that includes traditional. So with that in mind, um, I want to get to the reason that we're here today, which is first of all to talk about celiac disease, which I know I could talk about for three hours, but really is not the reason why you came here today, because you want to hear more about probiotics, prebiotics, and the microbiome. So let's get started. Um, the first question is, what's the gluten problem look like? I think we sort of expanded the definition over time. And this is really the classic definition. This is my pediatric textbook um, and what we thought celiac disease was. But with serologic testing, as you all know, we're really discovering that celiac disease is much more than that and really affects many more people and has many more presentations in that classic presentation. So what your job is, is when you see patients who have almost any symptoms, because almost any symptom has been reported to be related to celiac disease, to think celiac disease and think folks bring them up. Because the thing about celiac disease, if you don't think about it, just like most other conditions, you're not going to diagnose it. And so it's obligatory to have an iceberg slide and to talk about celiac disease. Um, the concept here is not that the habitat for polar bears. The concept is that most people who are most people are asymptomatic and below the waterline and unrecognized and undiagnosed. Some of those people are symptomatic and some are not. So it's our job to find them and bring them up above the waterline and melt the iceberg. Um, so, how are we going to find these people? I know you guys know a lot about screening for celiac disease. Uh, there's different antibodies, and it's mostly based on the tissue transcontaminase, which is present in the intestine and practically every cell in the body, and it's really the autoantigen for celiac disease. And in these cell antibodies, where the earlier tests, they actually have the same target, the TTG. It's just a technical difference in how the test is done. Gliadin antibodies are the first antibodies, uh, which we don't use anymore. And then deamidated gliadin are the new kids on the block, and they are um, your first-line test in IgA deficient patients. So screening, think PTG, more sensitive tests, EMA more specific but less sensitive, 
and its IGA position, or refer them to your gastroenterologist. So getting back to the beginning here, this is probably pretty much a slam dunk for celiac disease. We've done our serology. It's more than 25 times the upper limit of normal. We've got failure to thrive. We've got diarrhea. We've got anemia. And so his mother asked, I'm worried about anesthesia risk. Can celiac disease be diagnosed without a biopsy? And I have to say this is something that we're spending more and more time talking about, in part because there's newer guidelines um, that suggest that in some patients this may be possible. And the diagnostic algorithm is fairly simple. The first thing is to think about celiac disease and do the screening test, and you're getting, going to get a result back. No matter what the result is, if you're really worried about the kid, you're going to send them to GI. If it's positive, no matter how positive it is, you're still going to send them to the gastroenterologist. And then our job, gastroenterologist, is to sort out, can we diagnose this child without a biopsy? Should we do a biopsy? And does this child need a free diet? Or is this not even celiac disease at all? So I can tell you that at Boston Children's, we diagnose the vast majority of our patients by biopsy, even though there is this guideline. And I actually give my patients a choice. So if I have a patient who needs the criteria for a non-biopsy diagnosis, I lay out the arguments on either side. And parents usually know what to feel and whether they want a biopsy or not, but most opt for the biopsy, and there's a few compelling reasons. I think one is serology is not 100%, and celiac disease and the gluten-free diet, which is our treatment for now, is a serious consideration that's lifelong, and so you really want to be 100% sure that that's what you're looking at. Also, often when we biopsy, we may find H. pylori or eastern cell esophagitis or another treatable condition that we would not have found if we did not do the biopsy. Another thing is that once you go on a gluten-free diet, the great thing about celiac disease is that things get better. The bad thing about celiac disease is that if you're already on a gluten-free diet, it can be harder to figure out if you were ever sick in the first place. And so really, before going on a gluten-free diet is the one best chance to get a good diagnosis, and so that's one of the reasons why, primary reasons why we biopsy. We've also been more involved in studies of treatments that are alternatives to the gluten-free diet. And the criteria for these studies always require biopsy confirmed diagnosis. And so we do worry that if these treatments are successful, patients who haven't had a biopsy may not be um, eligible for them because they might be denied coverage. And I think particularly for our pediatric patients, it's hope the reality that they will have a choice other than the diet sometime in their lifetime. So we diagnose celiac disease in Ivan. He comes back, he's doing great, he's growing. One of the most amazing things is that first visit in these young kids with celiac disease. I have a couple who come in and the electronic record has refused their weight because it doesn't believe that they can gain that much weight in that much time. Parents are delighted. Um, so I think one of the most satisfying things is the most satisfying diagnosis to make. Um, of course, it's, um, oh, sorry, my backwards. It's not all easy, and I think one of the unique things about celiac disease is that most of the management is on the shoulders of the patient and the family, and there's guidelines which really center around the idea that the treatment is the diet, and you need to educate about the diet. And as Dr. Krugman already said, you're very lucky here to have an excellent food diet education program and excellent resources, including, I hope you all recognize here, the uh, Gluten-Free Resource Center app, which is something we should all be recognizing by recommending to your patients and recommend to our patients. Um, and really is a good resource for not only dietary information, but also up-to-date information on what's happening in celiac disease that is correct and accurate. I think really as we have more and more sources of information with varying degrees of quality, it's very important to have sources of information we can refer our patients to that we can trust. And this is really a great resource for your patients with celiac disease. And there's podcasts, which also means that there's other ways besides just looking at your phone. So, of course, management is gluten-free diet, and the important thing is that's not just wheat, it's also rye, barley, spelt, kumut, and a long, long list of other things. The reason why it's some grains and not others has to do with what storage proteins they make and genetics. Oats are a bit of a special case. Definitely there are some patients whose T cells recognize avenin in um, oats the same way they recognize gliadin in gluten. So oats are complicated, um, and definitely not something that all patients really so, 
we discussed the diet, we've had our follow-up visit, we're just about ready to go, and then Mrs. Obele has one last question, which is that her daughter, Ivana, also went on a gluten-free diet and she decided to put the whole family on a gluten-free diet, and now her headaches have improved. So does she have celiac disease too? And I have to say this is one of the more common presentations these days, it's one of the benefits about more awareness of celiac disease and awareness of gluten-free diet is that people are thinking about celiac disease. Unfortunately, a lot of them are thinking about celiac disease before they come to see us. And so, what if your patient is already on a gluten-free diet? This is the flip side of why biopsy somebody who, may, who has a high serology. And the problem is that just because you feel better on a gluten-free diet doesn't mean the reason you're not feeling well on a gluten-free diet is celiac. Therefore, if you want to make the diagnosis, Depending how long they've been on a gluten-free diet, you might get lucky. They might still have really high serology, and they might um, have a genetic. But in most cases, you're going to be thinking about a gluten challenge, um, which is why it's important to make sure that the patients have had the diagnosis confirmed before they start going on a gluten-free diet, or at the very least, having an antibody level is drawn into them. The bottom line is there's lots of ways to do this, and that's another thing that you can get from your pediatric gastroenterologist. So we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about gluten challenges. Uh, you know, questions at the end, I'm happy to answer. Um, one thing that we do get a lot of questions about is genetic testing, and this is because HLA, DQ2, and DQ8 are actually the um, MHC complexes that can prevent parts of the immune system. So if you don't have these MHCs, it's very hard for you to develop celiac disease and sensitization to gluten because you just can't prevent antigen. And so the vast majority of patients Celiac disease has DQ2, which comes in different forms. Others have DQ8. And so it's great if you're wondering and you have a high TTG. The problem is that 30% of the general population can have DQ2 or DQ8. And most of those people don't have and will never have celiac disease. So it's not a very useful test for um, ruling in celiac disease. A negative test is perhaps more helpful although I think there's many caveats to this because as we learn more, we're finding more and more minor allele variants that actually do confer susceptibility for celiac disease and not all labs are testing for them, which is why if you really suspect celiac disease, you really have to buy out your patient. Again, the positive test doesn't really rule in, doesn't really rule out celiac disease, and so often I think we get the positive test and we regret having ordered the test in the first place. So make sure you really want either results before you order. Another thing we're seeing more and more is that just as patients can go on a gluten-free diet by themselves, and now they can order TTG testing by themselves direct to consumer, they can also get direct to consumer genetic testing. And so one of the most popular is 23andMe, and they do report on celiac disease, which has been reviewed by the FDA. Uh, the important thing for you to know is that the testing is probably reliable, but it doesn't actually test for all of the alleles that are associated with celiac disease. So a positive test is helpful, but a negative test definitely for 23 and does not go up susceptibility. So what if it's not celiac disease? And I think as people have learned more about celiac disease and there's been more awareness about celiac disease and gluten, there's been more awareness that, well, gluten can do more things to you than just instigate celiac disease. And so there's sort of a now category of gluten-related disorders and trying to break this up. We've really talked about the first category, the autoimmune category, which is celiac disease, dermatitis herpetiformis, which is more skin manifestations, which is really not a pediatric disease and is only seen in older adults, likely because you have to have a long period of active disease in order to develop the skin lesions. Um, the next major category is actually French allergies uh, to gluten. And so, Wheat allergy comes in a few forms. We always think about anaphylaxis, um, but there's also um, Baker's Lyme, occupational rhinitis, um, all those things from our board exams. And then there's this interesting phenomenon, which is wheat dependent exercise induced anaphylaxis. And this is a phenomenon where if you exercise, you're all right. If you eat wheat, you're all right. But if you eat wheat and then you exercise, you anaphylax. And this can be something that's hard to pick up because it's not consistent. And especially as we exercise less and less, most people are tolerating the meat most of the time because they're not exercising after they eat. And so 
um, how do you diagnose these things? So we all know about skin testing, which is the first line uh, test. Um, also, we have uh, in vitro assays where we can quantify IgG levels. And then for the sweet dependent exercise induced classes, we actually have to feed the patient's wheat and put them on a treadmill or some other form of exercise and wait for them to anaphylax, which tells you that we don't really have a great diagnostic test for this condition and makes the biopsy seem a lot less barbaric. Um, what's interesting is there's some small data series from Japan showing that if you actually look in the blood of people who respond to the gluten challenge positively and they have wheat and they anaphylax, you can actually detect wheat in their blood, where those who don't respond on that particular challenge don't detect wheat, which again is a reminder that the intestine is not something that's constant and it's something that's context dependent and environment dependent and definitely we know that exercise in and of itself affects intestinal permeability, which may be part of the mechanism that has been meaning there's more availability of wheat antigen into the bloodstream in order to promote anaphylaxis. But fascinating condition, um, not celiac disease, um, and definitely something in the spectrum of things that can do to you that probably if we knew more about, we would understand a lot of things better. The other thing that I want to quickly mention is, of course, you can get these serum IgG food allergy panels, which really are meaningless, um, and we don't really know how to interpret them. Um, and actually, the vendor of major, one of the major vendors of the test actually, um, we were discussing this test and said as much. They really aren't sure what the clinical application is. But usually, because you're most exposed to food you have most often, you're going to have the strongest reactions to food you see most often, but there's no real clinical correlate there. So, not useful. So, what if it's not celiac disease? What if it's not allergy? We then get into this not autoimmune, not allergic food sensitivity category which is the most nebulous and the most vague. And there's not really a lot to say about it. It was something that was first noted in the early 80s and then sort of fell out of, um, fell out of attention, really, until this paper in 2012. And this is a paper from uh, Peter Gibson's group in Australia. And what they did is they took patients who were biopsy-negative celiac, serology-negative celiac, but were convinced that they felt better on a gluten-free diet. And they did a double-blind, randomized, people controlled re-challenge trial. So they continued their gluten-free diet the whole way through. For one portion, they had placebo gluten. For the other portion, they had active gluten. And then they looked at the symptoms between the two times. And they found that their symptoms indeed seemed to be exacerbated by gluten, which then was really taken up by the press and this idea that, yes, there's a non-celiac gluten sensitivity. The problem is that they didn't really have a mechanism, and all of the things they looked at, looking for immune mech um, activation, looking for intestinal permeability changes, inflammation, they didn't find anything. So that leaves us as gluten sensitivity is a diagnosis purely of exclusion, looking at ruling out the other things that are reactions to wheat that we do know what, it, what causes them and we can investigate, um, and being left with, well, you do better when you're not taking gluten, so don't have gluten. Now, this group from Australia made the mistake of asking one more question. And so what they did is they said, well, you know, gluten is in a lot of grain, but there's also other things. And so maybe the problem isn't gluten. Maybe the problem is gluten friends. And so one of the things that lots of gluten eating products have in them is fermentable carbohydrates. And so they decided, let's repeat this experiment, but this time, instead of Looking, but let's compare these fermentable carbohydrates to gluten. And what they found was that the reaction was actually to these fermentable carbohydrates, which are called FODMAP, and not to gluten. So what is a FODMAP and why do you care? That's not the focus of the talk today. Um, but briefly, the idea is that our intestinal bacteria are digesting for us much of the food that we are unable to digest. In fact, gluten is a great example. We don't have great endoproteases that can um, digest it, and so most of it passes straight through, which is why you've got a great stool study running, um, but some of it is eaten by the bacteria, um, and bacteria produce gas, and they produce other substances, and that affects how your body works. And so the FODMAP diet is very popular right now as one approach to managing IBS. What's interesting is when you look at IBS studies, actually it seems like changing the diet is maybe as important as any particular diet that you try. 
So where does that leave us? That leaves us with celiac disease, which we think we know and think we understand, allergies, which are probably a similar state of understanding in celiac disease, and non-celiac sensitivity, which we really don't know what it is, and it's controversial whether it exists, but there's many people who wouldn't think that it does. So taking a step back, I want to get back to this idea that really we eat different foods, we have different diets, and this affects our, affects our bodies in different ways, and how is this needed? So there's a lot of talk these days about the microbiome, which um, is actually interested in intestinal bacteria when I was doing my PhD, um, then went to medical school, but microbiome wasn't a word, so I didn't know that was what I wanted to study, and then in training for a dozen years, and kind of missed the boat on this one, but it's still fascinating. So we actually have more bacterial cells than we have human cells. And, when, and, and these bacteria survive mentally in our gut. And really, their substrate, their fertilizer is whatever we eat. So when we, when we eat, we're partly feeding ourselves, but we're also feeding all of our commensal bacteria. And so in a sense, eating is farming, and that has impact because these bacteria have a relationship with us. So there's lots of statistics on just how many bacteria there are, but I think what's more interesting is that we actually don't know a lot about this. So we really haven't had great techniques to study these bacteria because of issues with culturing, and so really it's not been until the modern genomic era that we can even start to tackle this problem. Um, what, what we do know is that it seems that there's no particular combination of bacteria that's healthy, per se, but that most people who are more healthy seem to have more variety in their bacteria, which if you think about agriculture kind of makes sense And that if you have crop diversity, you tend to have healthier agriculture program than if you have monoculture, and it's probably the same in our intestine. So one of the questions is, what are all of these bacteria doing? And I think there's the things that we all know, vitamin K, fermentation, short-chain fatty acids, the things we don't think about as much, which are probably just as important are that a lot of these bacteria actually make cytokines and stimulate our immune system, stimulate our nervous system, and there's a bi-directional relationship. They're communicating with us, and we're communicating with them. And some of them actually synthesize neurotransmitters. So I wanted to show a few studies to talk a little bit about what's happening in the field of the microbiome. I think it's important to note that most of this work is very new. Um, within the last decade, um, and it's complicated. Probably one of the more complicated projects we have, maybe exploring the solar system, but this one is a little bit more internal, a little bit deeper. And so this particular study was asking a simple question, which is, does geography matter? So you have bacteria, they can sequence the bacteria, you can use the databases to figure out what metabolic processes are happening, which bacteria are there. but is is there any specialization? So what they did is they sampled different places in healthy people, and they sampled biopsies to see what bacteria are living right on the surface, what are the ones that are closest to us, and then they also sampled what was inside the intestinal tract, and then they also sampled what comes out of the intestinal tract or stool. And what you see here is a series of colors. Each color represents a different type of metabolic process. Um, for instance, the one on the top is glycolysis, um, the bright pink one is nitrogen metabolism. And what you can see is that the actual function of these bacteria varies along the intestinal tract. And even in a given position in the intestinal tract, what's happening right close to the mucosa is not the same as what's happening in the skin. Which gives you an idea that this is something complicated that's going to take us a little bit to figure out. Um, and probably the ways we've been manipulating it are rather crude for the type of system that actually is. This is another way of looking at the same study. So um, in this particular uh, figure, what they've done is they've done principal components analysis to try and see uh, if there's signal in the data that they can use to naturally separate these samples. So this is a label-free method where you put your data into the computer, and based on the data itself, does this fit better in four groups or five groups, and what's in those groups? And then after you've done that analysis, you then overlay where the sample came from. So the computer doesn't know in advance if it came from stool or if it came from And what you can see here 
is that on the left, the colors separate very well, which is another way of saying that the function varies depending on location. And we all know that, right? From real estate, location, 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 it's the same as your vector. The right-hand side is another way of showing this. This is a volcano plot, which is essentially looking at, okay, what are these metabolic processes and which are the ones that are the most different between the lumen of the colon and stool. And the reason to show this is not to review this, but to really show that there's a lot going on. It's complicated, and we don't understand, but we're manipulating this all the time. So, this is really one of the first studies that really brought attention to the microbiome and really helped expand the field. This was published in 2013. Over 80% of all papers on the microbiome have been published since this paper. So this is a really new field. And this is looking at Quashior core, which we all know um, is uh, malnutrition, specific phenotypes. And what they decided to do is say, okay, let's take um, stool from these patients and see what happens if we transplant them into mice. The thought being that maybe it wasn't actually a patient problem, it was a microbiome problem. So what they found was that if they took the healthy child and put those bacteria into a germ-free mouse, then they were healthy when they gave them this um, ready-to-use seed for therapeutic food to what they used to treat malnutrition. They had rapid weight gain. And then when they put them back on the normal diet, they went back to baseline. The stool from the patients with Quashior core, when they gave it to the mice, the mice developed a phenotype. The mice lost weight, had a dominant dissension. When they gave them the therapeutic food, they gained weight even faster, just like we see in children, and there was a change in the microbiota. What was interesting is when they put them back on their normal diet, that wasn't sustained. And one of the other things is that the complexity of the of the bacterial community in the sick children was much less than the complexity of the community in the well children. And that's really something that you want to see broad brush strokes seems to come across study after study. So how can we use this? Is there any therapeutic use to this? It's all very interesting, very fascinating. We talk about poop forever, but what are we going to do with it? And we've actually been doing a lot with this for a long time. So. Um, in China, in 400 BC, they were actually using uh, feces to um, treat food poisoning. And in a famous medical textbook from the 1600s, they actually provide a recipe for yellow soup. Now, I hope this is not something that you've eaten. It's made from, there's a few different variations, but basically it's human feces. You can have them fresh, you can have them fermented, you can have them dried. And they use it for a variety of abdominal complaints, and apparently it works. Now, also, this technology of basically coprophagia was also used in the Middle East. And interestingly, the German soldiers during World War II used camel feces um, to treat dysentery, and it was apparently effective. So in 1954 is really the first paper in the modern microbiome era. It was a small case series of four patients who had what at that time was called pseudomembranous colitis. And what they did is they gave these patients fecal enemas uh, from healthy people. As we know, and, and all of them survived, whereas usually mortality rates for um, pseudomembrane life is very high. And so this sort of peaked interest in this idea. As we know, pseudomembrane colitis is one of the manifestations of Clostridium difficile, and that Clostridium difficile has actually become a very important and a very dangerous pathogen. I think we underestimated its pediatrician because we don't see it very often. My lab in Boston is run by Karen Kelly and he really divides his interest between celiac disease and diff. And so every study they do, their outcomes are ICU admission and death because people die from diff, and it's a huge problem in the adult hospitals that I don't think we really appreciate here because we're just not seeing 15 or 20% mortality. Um, but it is something that is a good example of what happens when you have your microbial community not working as it should. Because most of us are seeded carriers, um, and in fact, it's considered normal flora during the early years of life. But most of us are not sick from our CDF. So there needs to be something that changes to give that CDF the opportunity to become pathogenic. And we really don't know what that is, but we do know that a common trigger is antibiotics, um, and the mechanism whereby antibiotics facilitate CDF colonization is unknown, but definitely 
is there, which is why it's common hospital acquired infection, and there's over 10,000 deaths a year in the US. So this is really one of the best indications for fecal therapy. And so this is a paper from New England Journal of Medicine, and to give you an idea of how good this therapy is, they had 60 patients in the study. They published it in the New England Journal of Medicine because look at their effect sizes, they're amazing. So on the left, you see the patients who had current C. diff um, who were treated with fecal transplant. On the right, third column is vancomycin, and then the fourth column is vancomycin plus bowel lavage to wash out the C. diff. And you can see who feeds vancomycin pretty much every time. And this has been repeated again and again and again. Um, it's been problematic because there's not a great source of stool. Um, and that stool is not really a drug, and it's highly variable from person to person from deposit to deposit. And so the FDA really struggled with this, and so they have come up with a position that fecal transplant itself is considered to be investigational. But because of the evidence of C. diff, the C. diff has certain the FDA has certain conditions where treating C. diff with FNT is not considered investigational, and that's basically your severe and relapsing. Now, on the right, you see some pills, because what's interesting is it really doesn't even matter that much how you administer the therapy. And so you can do a lavage, you can do pills, you can do colonoscopy, spray it on the way out, you can do an enema. It doesn't actually seem to matter. And so um, the major source of feces for transplant is in Boston, it's open biome, and uh, was actually started because of recognition that there was a need for stool. And so they call themselves the Brown Cross for obvious reasons. Um, and most of their donors are um, actually students in the Boston area. So hopefully the type of stool you want. But we don't really know what a good stool is. Now, a lot of people are turned off by the idea of taking stool pills. A lot of people are turned off by the idea of taking enemas. And part of it is that poop just stinks. And so, this is a really interesting study where what they decided was, well, let's not do poop because poop isn't really that nice. Let's see if we can just get some of the liquid from poop and clean it up a little bit and if that works too. And so this particular study, they got the stool and they had a custom system to try and filter it, but they were just getting with the fraction, which as you can see here, directly from the paper, was a light brown, clear liquid the subjectively less unpleasant and intensive odor in comparison to the pre-filtered microbiota-rich slurry used in conventional preparation for FNT. Now, what's most interesting about this is that it worked. So they tried it in five patients who had had prolonged courses of relapsing C. diff. They gave it mesodegenal food, and 100% had resolution of diarrhea in four days. And this is pretty typical. The time to onset the benefit for um, fetal transplant C. diff is um, and the follow-up period they had, which was going on nearly three years in some patients, none of them had relapsed. And so what's interesting about this is that they don't seem to engage people bacteria, which is another important mes message. We talk about the microbiome, we talk a lot about bacteria, and part of the reason for that is that we can do 16 SRNA sequences and we can see them, and we can have some idea of what's there. But really, there's a lot more there. There's funguses, parasites, and there's bacteria. So really, I think the next phase is going to be looking at bacteriophages and how do these affect the bacteria that are there, and that actually is probably important in many conditions we don't recognize. So what can we do about this? These treatments are experimental, but definitely I'm sure you've had a patient ask you about probiotics in the last, if not the last week, definitely the last month. I don't think we can get through a GI clinic without talking about probiotics. And the idea of probiotics is basically to take the bacteria itself to try and somehow influence your microbiome. And related to probiotics, prebiotics, which is the concept that you can either take the bacteria or you can eat a substrate that promotes that bacteria. And so it's something that you can go and you can buy your culturelle, or you can take the probiotics and prebiotics that are part of our diet that we've been eating for centuries. And so yogurt, Lots of bacteria. Sauerkraut, lots of bacteria. Cinnamon, lots of substrate for um, different uh, bacteria and it's going to affect your microbiome. So 
again, what you eat is farming your microbiome, and you're going to favor some things over the other, which really gets to the whole point, which is what do we do with this information? And there's lots of interesting things, but how do we apply this, and is there anything we can learn from clinical practice? And I think the one thing to take away is that this links with nutritional science in an important way because we're recognizing that actually it's the quality of your diet that matters and not the actual constituents of your diet. And so if you have compounds that are going to cause inflammation, that are going to promote pro-inflammatory bacteria, that's probably a problem. And it doesn't really necessarily matter where those things are coming from. But generally, it seems like we tolerate plant-based foods better. Red meat is a carcinogen, as well as probably being pro-inflammatory. And so that's why if you look around the world, you have different types of food pyramids or other schemes that are typically the same. Um, this is an interesting study, um, which is actually from China, where they are seeing a rise in uh, metabolic syndrome. And interestingly, this is associated with a decrease in the amount of carbohydrates in the diet, whereas in North America, we classically think of increase in carbohydrates in the diet. This. And so this particular study um, is an example of why it's so hard to figure these things out, because you want longitudinal data and you want people to be on a diet. So they actually recruited 217 people, they randomized them to low, medium, or high-fat diet, and then they provided them all their food for six months. Because dietary studies are really hard, because gluten-free diet is hard for the same reason. Eating is a social activity, and so it's more than just taking some pills and moving on with your day. And so they looked at metabolic inflammatory markers, and they looked at which bacteria were there, and they looked at what metabolites were there. On the right is the food pagoda, which is sort of the Chinese interpretation of the food pyramid. Um, and this is just one figure from the paper, which I know doesn't project very well, but essentially on the left-hand side, you see at the beginning of the study, when they look at their metabolite profile, all the different dots from the different diets overlap with each other because they all started in the same place. On the right-hand side, you can see the yellow dots are on one side and the red and blue dots are on the other because the higher fat diet really had a different profile than the other two diets, showing that just changing the substrate changes your metabolism and changes basically the end product of your body and your function. So it's a little late for us, maybe, right? It's been a while. I know that I've had my fair share of Big Macs and, you know, is it too late? And so I think this is a reassuring study um, that comes out of uh, the group at Harvard School of Public Health, where they took some of these big cohort studies where they have dietary information and they have longitudinal dietary information, and they actually scored the quality of the diet. And then they looked at the people whose diet quality was stagnant versus those who improved their diet over time. So if you think about sort of a healthy eating index or a Mediterranean diet, these are what we sort of hold up across the world as the healthy diet. And so they had um, years of data, serial assessments, and they decided to look at death, which is, you know, was the hardest outcome we have. And what was reassuring was that those who improved their diet most had the greatest decrease in their mortality in the baseline. And those who didn't change their diet really didn't have much of a reduction. So changing, improving your diet quality is going to improve the overall function of your intestinal ecosystem your body ecosystem, and probably it's going to help you live longer. Now, what we're supposed to be talking about celiac disease, last slide, because I know everybody has to run around and everything else. Um, this is an interesting study where, again, this is a prospective cohort study. Uh, this is one of these studies where they, uh, this is a Generation R study from Rotterdam, where they recruit a cohort of children and then follow them over time. And so they looked at dietary patterns at one year and then development of celiac disease up to six years. And they were able, based on this limited data, because one-year-olds don't have a very broad diet, to sort of find different categories of diets. And so here a prudent diet is like a Mediterranean-type diet, like a healthy eating diet. So high vegetables, low sugar, low refined grains, and moderate amounts of fish and grain. And interestingly, these kids who ate this diet had a lower risk of developing celiac disease than the ones who are on either the snacks and processed foods diet or a diet that was richer in dairy and cereal. So what is it about food? What is it that makes us healthier? We don't know, but 
study after study seems to be showing to us that definitely there's some foods that are better for you and some foods that are not. So eat your vegetables, eat some fish, don't eat that many large animals, and try and avoid the sugar even if it's tasty, which is essentially where a prudent diet comes from. Um, and, and water should be a beverage. Wine is controversial, but most people allow some, um, which gets us back to where we started. So I look after a population that has a diet that's very different. So just to caribou, uh, blue whale, foods that have very different nutritional profile, but have sustained this um, community for a long time. And now we've introduced these other types of refined and processed foods, and the outcome has not been very good. And so this is actually in the new group food guide, um, trying to help somehow express these ideas that there's certain foods that are more healthy and how do we work in those more tasty, perhaps refined and processed foods to try and overall get a healthy diet that's going to lead us where we want to be, which is having healthy people. So are we going to get there? I don't know. Um, it's all changing. This is a picture of the sea ice, not quite formed. Um, last year was actually the lowest year on record for the sea ice in the Arctic um, and definitely has profound effects um, and affects our ability to produce food and what we eat and even how that food is. So there's some interesting studies showing that because there's more carbohydrates, carbon dioxide around, it's almost like we're giving plants metabolic syndrome. So because there's more carbohydrates available, there's more carbon dioxide available, it affects what plants and eating actually are. And so I think it's fascinating. It's all very interrelated, and we're having profound effects on everything, and we'll have to see what happens. But ultimately, what do you need to remember? Think about celiac disease. You want to find the patients with celiac disease. Diagnose them before you treat them. Gluten sensitivity is a diagnosis of exclusion, so think about these other causes. And the microbiome, definitely important, not very well understood, but have a healthy respect for it. And encourage your patients. I think one of the challenges with these studies is getting patients to give us poop. They throw it away, they flush it, but they will not bring it into us. Um, and so I think, you know, helping, helping to familiarize the idea that maybe we can learn a lot. So. Acknowledgements to my team at Harvard, team in Manitoba, where I also do research education to talk about. Again, thank you for the invitation. It's been wonderful to be here, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Bill. I just want to remind you that um, our speaker is going to be here for another hour will be lunch available for those of you who are interested. And so, of course, many of us go and do what you've got to do at uh, 1 o'clock. But we'll be staying here for a little bit longer. So please, let's have your questions. Yeah. I have a question that the study fascinates me. The study, the last study you mentioned, as someone interested in cardiometabolic risk and these dietary patterns are clearly associated with cardiometabolic risk um, longitudinally, but also with mitochondrial function. What's known, because the gut has such a huge energy sink to keep restoring that turnover of the gut lining at all times. What's known about intrinsic mitochondrial function and risk to celiac disease? A lot of people carry the trait, but not a lot of people exhibit. So that's a great question, and definitely there's been some ultrastructural studies where they've looked at family members of people who have celiac disease, and when you look at their small intestine, their mitochondria do look different, and they have a different phenotype. There's a great study that was just published last week in gut looking at a prospective cohort of children with um, inflammatory bowel disease, showing quite clearly that there's an interaction between the microbiome and the enterocyte which affects mitochondrial function and that recovery of colitis is associated with improvement of mitochondrial function. So yes, I think in the interest of full disclosure, I did do my PhD in mitochondrial uh, bioenergetics at a mitochondrial institute, um, but I think the mitochondria is finally getting its time um, and is very important. And Mind your mitochondria. <laughs> yeah. 
Go ahead. Hi. Um, I recall hearing somebody give their testimony regarding this, actually. I think it was NPR or something. Uh, and then I read something, I think, on BBC about donors and whatnot um, abroad. Uh, you had stated that there's now a depository up in Boston? So there is Open Biome. Uh, open Biome, okay. Um, and then you said that uh, I think uh, the students are coming in. Do you, do you screen like their diet? Oh, so that's a great or? question. So how do you screen yeah. stool? And so that's something that's not well known. It's part of the reason why there's caution and why there's a lot of registries for fecal transplants. So it really parallels the organ transplant okay. um, criteria. So they're looking for, you know, HIV, other bloodborne infections. Um, screening for known oral pathogens like Salmonella shigella, but not anything really comprehensive. There were some early studies suggesting that maybe an obese donor would make the recipient obese, and so there had been some weight requirements, but more recent studies have suggested that that phenotype you know, movement is still durable. Um, so that's part of the reason why they look for healthy people. They don't want people to have a lot of immune sensitization, so if you've had a child, you're out, um, and why it looks like that male. Okay, yeah, because I wasn't sure with the, uh, you said the filtration and whatnot, if it, it did anything with that. I was talking more about the diet, not so much HIV and all of that. So that, that, that's what you're saying, you still look for healthy people, it's not necessarily Yeah, so they have to be it. metabolically healthy. Okay. Um, but there's a lot of beer drunk at MIT, and there's a lot of people from MIT giving their school, so. Um, Just, just real quickly, great talk, thank you. Um, John would have been very happy, would be very happy. Um, question for you, so this genetic susceptibility is interesting. Is there any role conceivably for early life screening to identify high, genetically high risk groups and then introduce some early life uh, uh, dietary modifications that perhaps aren't uh, uh, gluten uh, restriction but uh, somehow might prevent the development of, of celiac disease? Well, I think that's the problem, is that everybody should be eating their vegetables for all sorts of reasons, um, but kids just don't want to eat their vegetables. Um, so it's an interesting question, and definitely there's some, um, there's some risk factors that are stronger than others, genetics being a very strong risk factor. So having two copies of each of two has the highest penetrance. So 15% of these kids, all comers, have celiac disease by the time they're five. If you're a girl and you're in Sweden and you have a parent with celiac disease, you're pushing 70%. And so that's when you start to wonder, you know, why are you giving these children gluten anyway? Um, but no, there's not, part of the problem is that we don't really know how celiac disease starts, so we don't really know how to prevent it. 